Photography is the art of recording light on various media. Its history can be drawn back to the 4th century when Greek mathematicians began using the pinhole camera and camera obscura to draw and trace images. This technology was later independently developed around the world and is a precursor to photography. It wasn't until the 1800s that Thomas Wedgwood captured the first image from light, leading the way to what we would consider modern photography. He used a light-sensitive substance, silver nitrate, on paper and was able to capture shadows of objects in direct light. Camera obscura proved too faint for this process. Soon, better light-sensitive substances and processing techniques were created to get better images. However, exposure time still ran into hours and sometimes even days. Digital photography has enabled more artistic expression, such as allowing for images of quick moving objects, low light environments, and distinct objects. In addition, Advancements in software have allowed for more robust post-processing techniques for digital images. Most importantly, digital photography allows artists to be more creative with their photographs as the time costs with film processing and real costs of film itself are reduced. Going forward, one of the most interesting types of sensors being developed is a light field sensor. Light field technologies promise to capture both light intensity, like a traditional camera, and light ray direction. This technology allows for new post-processing abilities, like refocusing an image on a new subject. Lightro is one of the first companies to uh, produce consumer-grade light field cameras. While the image quality wasn't that great from these cameras, they were a great proof of concept of the uh, benefits of being able to adjust focus after shooting the images. There are a few traditionally held rules of thumb for photography composition, depending on the style of image. But as with most art, these are more suggestions rather than rules. These rules of thumb generally focus on highlighting the subject of the image while making sure the overall image is aesthetically pleasing. These rules include the rule of thirds, balance, leading lines, symmetry, background, depth, and framing. There are many more guidelines photographers follow, but these are some of the most important. However, we'll see that they don't apply in all situations and that experimenting with these rules can lead to some beautiful images. For example, in portrait and wildlife photography, the subject is simple to highlight. However, taking an aesthetic image is much harder to accomplish. Landscapes, on the other hand, tend to be the most difficult, in my opinion, as the subject of the scene is less well-defined and must be highlighted using more subtle cues, while still maintaining good framing and composition. The rule of thirds is one of the most well-known rules of thumb, and is one of the most important aesthetic principles in photography. The basic idea is to not center the subject in the frame and not have the horizon split the image in half. Instead, the subject and horizon should be aligned near the intersections or along the line shown in the grid here. The reason behind why the rule of thirds is so aesthetically pleasing is that it comes from the golden ratio. Ideally, we would use the golden spiral instead of the grid, but the grid approximation is much easier to use in practice and is ultimately up to the photographer to frame the shot correctly. Here, we see four golden spirals laid in each of the four corners of the image, and I've overlaid the rule of thirds grid over it, and you can see that the centers of the golden spirals correspond closely with the centers of the rule of thirds grid. From the rule of thirds follows another rule of thumb, balance. When applying the rule of thirds, it's important not to forget the rest of the image space. It is common to focus solely on the rule of thirds and leave the rest of the image empty with solid blue sky or water. This empty space in the image around the subject leads to an unbalanced scene and can look unappealing. In order to balance the image without detracting from the subject, it is common to include elements like trees, grasses, buildings, etc. that act as a weight to balance the image by adding texture and color. An example of an image that correctly uses the rule of thirds in balance can be seen here. You see that the geese are aligned with the rule of thirds grid, but the background is not flat and empty. You have some texture from the plants growing in the top left, and the separation of the grass and water help to add some balance to the image. When taking portraits, people's eyes are naturally drawn to the subject's eyes and face. This phenomenon, to a lesser degree, can be seen in wildlife photography as well. However, with landscapes, it is important to use other cues to draw the viewer's eyes to the subject, as it is not always clear. In order to accomplish this, most photographers use leading lines, which are natural or man-made things which include but are not limited to roads, buildings, rivers, trees, waves, and light rays.
These lines help define the depth of an image and provide a subconscious cue to lead the viewer and highlight the subject. The lines do not have to lead to a specific object, however. They can also lead to infinity, which is common to see with roads. This example of leading lines doesn't lead to infinity. It leads instead to the red maple tree found in the image. The leading lines in this case aren't as straight as the road example from before, but the path of stones going towards the back of the image help guide the viewer towards the subject of the image. Leading lines lead to another composition rule of thumb, which is depth. Photography is inherently a two-dimensional art form, but in certain instances, usually with landscapes, it is aesthetically pleasing to highlight the depth in an image. This means that the composition of the shot includes a foreground, middle layers, and a background. One technique to show this depth is with leading lines as mentioned earlier, but another more powerful technique is occlusion. Leading lines can imply depth subconsciously, but occlusion can give a more overt indication of depth. For example, in this image of a Scottish mountain, you can see the foreground consists of a lake, followed by a middle layer scene with the farm and trees. This farm occludes the mountain, which is the true subject of the image, and adds a sense of depth and a point of reference, which shows you just how tall this mountain is. Another guideline to improve composition is symmetry. This guideline refers to vertical and horizontal lines in images. For example, when taking a photograph of a house, it is important to make sure vertical lines, like the sides of the house, trees, and doorways, are vertically symmetrical, and horizontals, like the horizon, bottom of the building, and shutters, are horizontally symmetrical. When this rule is not followed, it can be distracting and lead to a sense of unease in the viewer, so it's best to avoid this unless there's a specific need. This house is a good example of many rules, like rule of thirds, depth, balance, and leading lines. But let's focus on the symmetry. The door, chimney, and window panes all maintain their vertical symmetry, along with the background trees, while the bricks and house itself are horizontally symmetric with the horizon. Here are two examples of bad and good symmetry. The upper image shows a horizon that's misaligned by 2 or 3 degrees. By realigning this image as can be seen in a lower image, the entire image's aesthetic appeal is raised. The difference is subtle, but to most people the second image will seem more appealing. The next rule of thumb is background, and it's most important when shooting portraits of wildlife. You need to make sure that the background is not too busy, as that will detract from the subject and distract the viewer. When taking portraits, it's common to use a solid color background or a little texture as it completely places the subject in the spotlight. But with wildlife, this is not possible and it can be more appealing to see the animal in its natural habitat. Techniques to make this possible are to use a shallower depth of field to blur the background, a technique known as bokeh, to isolate the subject and get a lightly textured background. Another option is to use the sky, meadows, or water as a backdrop to focus on the subject. This image follows the rule of thirds, but in my opinion, it's not aesthetically pleasing. This can be attributed to the poor depth of field effect, which in this case blurred the far leaves, which creates patches of smooth green, which is broken by the in-focus bark on the tree. The trunk is so large that it attracts attention away from the bird, and the color of the tree itself is similar to that of the bird, which makes it more difficult to isolate the bird. This image does a much better job of highlighting the subject with a shallow depth of field background. It breaks the rule of thirds, but in this case there was no option, as there was nothing else in the background to use to fill the space. The final rule of thumb I'll be touching on is framing. This refers to surrounding the focus of an image with other objects, like trees or sky, to help draw attention towards the subject. This technique is generally applied to landscapes and images with less defined subjects. This image is a bad example of framing, as the image doesn't have a clear focus. As a photographer, I can tell you that the intention was to highlight the row of colorful homes, but the close focal length cuts out parts of the building and the overall image is too busy. It makes it hard for the viewer to focus on any one thing, and it's unclear what the subject of the image is. I'm a strong believer in the adage that the best camera is the camera you have with you. While many of these images were taken with the DSLR, some were taken with an average cell phone camera. They are proof that while the sensor and glass you are shooting with are important and allow for more creative shots, without the fundamental techniques, you are not going to get aesthetically pleasing images. As I mentioned before, post-processing allows modern photographers to make substantial modifications to images after the shoot, but most of these rules of thumb can't be applied in post. Since general availability of high-quality light field cameras is years out,
It remains important to give more than a second thought to composing your shots and only using post-processing as a tool rather than a crutch.